Also Revelation, I don't know if you noticed, by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. That's right out of the, the scriptures. It talks about how the, how the saints overcome persecution by the blood of the Lamb and by the testimony we're willing to give in those times. Turn your Bibles, please, to Mark's Gospel. Chapter 13, we're in the, what's called the Little Apocalypse. Continuing where we were last week, we read verses 5 to 23. We're going to read those again today and then pick up where we left off in that. But thinking about the inevitability of persecution. The inevitability of persecution. I hope you have your Bibles and have found Mark chapter 13. If you don't have a Bible with you, we're going to put the text on the screen because I want you to see the Word of God as well as hear the Word of God. There's something very powerful. I would uh, like for you to take it in. Let it wash over us. And then by the Spirit, instruct us. And as Joshua said, change us. Never be the same. Let's stand together. You follow along, please, as I read these verses. And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead you astray, lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes and various There will be famines. They are but the beginning of birth pains. But be on your guard. For they will deliver you over to councils. And you'll be beaten in synagogues, and you'll stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. When they put you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father is child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you'll be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now, and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. He says several times when we get through this passage, the, the, this chapter, be on guard. Be on guard. Be alert. Don't be deceived. May that be true of us. May he find us such people when he comes. Thank you. Please be seated. I told you last week that uh, the disciples, uh, having witnessed Jesus, scathing rebuke of Judaism, and particularly its leaders, as he was getting ready to do what he came to do in his mission and to, to bring uh, effectual end to the religion that was designed by God to usher Messiah in. The, the, I think the disciples are grasping here and, they, and they, they said, well, this is Bill Askell's paraphrase, well, Rabbi, at least the temple is amazing. That's what they're saying. <laughs> well, he, he burst that bubble too. Uh, and said there won't, there won't be two stones left on another. And so when he says that, that prompts the question that it opens up this passage. Well, what, when will these things be? Tell us. Help us understand this. 
so the rest of the chapter is about the coming tribulation and then the coming back of the king uh, who will show himself the second time to be the captain of the armies of heaven and earth sovereign over everything no one can stand against him we read about such a reality in Romans 8 together earlier if this God is for us who can be against us came across a post that was actually written last week by Rod Dreher. It's entitled, We Have Been Warned. He talks about being in the flood zone of, of South Louisiana, ministering uh, to the heartache and the tragedy there. About how he saw the churches just engaged, helping setting up stations, for mercy stations. And he mentions one church in particular, Estrema Baptist Church in Baton Rouge. I'm familiar with that church. And he talked about, he says, it's true that civil society couldn't handle it on its own, this, this disaster. We need both. And that's what we're getting here. Estrema Baptist Church, for example, is one of the biggest churches in the city, has opened its campus as a staging area for relief operations. The work of the local church is both big and small and bringing desperately needed relief to the suffering is irreplaceable. I was thinking about this yesterday, thinking about how to many Americans the thing most important to them about churches, listen to what he says here, the way many Americans are thinking now, like those in the conservative part of America, is that they, the churches hold bigoted attitudes about the LBGT movement. In the years to come, those churches will be forced to pay a significant penalty for holding those views. Some people say that the loss of tax-exempt status, which is what many progressives would like to see happen to dissident churches, would be no big deal. Why should their tax dollars go to subsidize bigotry, they reason. It will be a very big deal. All contributions to churches and Christian organizations doing relief work are tax deductible at the present time. This will likely go away, dramatically hampering the resources available to conservative churches like Estrema to help the suffering in instances like this. As far as I know, nobody has seen crews from the Human Rights Campaign. By the way, the Human Rights Campaign, you need, need to get up to speed on this. When you see that term, that's the present day council that we're going to be handed over to. The human rights campaign is, a, is, a, is, a, is an, a wicked euphemism for people advancing the LBGT agenda. They're the ones in Iowa right now trying to bring down a church because the pastor dares to preach on the biblical view of marriage. He said, I haven't seen any crews in the human rights campaign mucking out houses or feeding refugees. Of course, if churches lose their tax exemption, they'll still do these things but they'll have many fewer resources with which to do so. Progressives either have not thought about this or as I suspect, they just don't care. Purity on LGBT issues is all that matters. This is what's gonna, I think, gonna astound you. Last year, a Baptist ethicist named David Gushy was quoted by a gay New York Times columnist, Frank Bruni, as saying that, quote, conservative Christian religion is the last bulwark against full acceptance of LGBT people, end quote. Because she has fully embraced gay rights and doesn't simply tolerate gay relationships, but affirms their goodness. He's written an extraordinary column laying out the future for Christians who reject the sexual revolution in its latest form. There's some excerpts from it. Quote, it turns out that you were either for, for full and unequivocal social and legal equality for LGBT people, or you were against it. And your answer will at some point be revealed. This is true both for individuals and for institutions. Neutrality is not an option. Neither is polite half acceptance, nor is avoiding the subject. Hide as you might, the issue will come and find you. End quote. He's talking about, when he says the issue, he's talking about those who will ferret out suspected thought criminals, interrogate them, force them to come clean about their bigotry. Because she lists all the kinds of people and institutions of American life that embrace homosexuality and transgenderism, and crucially, 
stigmatize those who do not. It's a sobering list for those who are not on it. And he's right. He also says that the Republican Party might still be officially on the side of moral traditionalists, but it's plain that that stance is fast eroding. Another quote. On the Democratic side, not only is LGBT equality now doctrine, sympathy for religious liberty exceptions is drying up quickly. If Hillary Clinton is elected president, making for 12 to 16 straight years of Democratic control of the White House, it is quite possible that by Supreme Court ruling and federal regulation, any kind of discrimination against gay people will have the same legal rights and social acceptance as any kind of racial discrimination, which is none. Continue to quote him. Openly discriminatory religious schools and parachurch organizations will feel the pinch first. Any entity that requires government accreditation or touches government dollars will be in the immediate line of fire. Some organizations will face the choice either to abandon discriminatory policies or risk potential closure. Others will simply face increasing social marginalization. A vast host of neutralists avoidist or de facto discriminatory institutions and individuals will also find that they can no longer finesse the LGBT issue. Space for neutrality or mild discrimination will close up as well." End quote. Now, I haven't read that to scare you. I've read it because he's right. He's right. So when we talk about the inevitability of persecution, we need to understand, and Brother Norman mentioned earlier, we prayed earlier, you know, we need to be like the sons of Issachar, wise discerning the times in which we live. Not, not, oh my goodness, not wringing our hands. We, we've sung the songs of Zion. We are more than conquerors. That doesn't mean, however, that we will escape persecution. This past week, many brothers and sisters in Christ around the world endured to the end. So I want us to take a look at this passage with those lenses. Not reading about it as something that happened in the past, or not reading about it as something that happened somewhere else, but reading about it as, Lord, how do I? prepare? How do we prepare? Now last week we went through some of these, some of these parts. I just want to mention the, the points. First of all, we looked at Jesus beginning to warn the disciples of coming trial. Then we, we looked at the inevitability of wars and, and, and human tragedy. We looked at the inevitability of persecution, verse 9. The, the connection between persecution and worldwide gospel proclamation, verse 10. Uh, parenthetically, where persecution intensifies, gospel advance intensifies more effectually. And then fifth, the folly of anxiety and assistance of the Holy Spirit. So it's because the Spirit will give us what we need. It's, it's folly to be, to be worried. Okay? Well, let's look at number six. The intense persecution and call to perseverance. Look at verses 12 and 13. How intense is it going to get? A brother will deliver a brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. That seems impossible, but it's going on right now, brothers and sisters. It is not unusual uh, in the Muslim world for a family member to, to come to faith in Christ and then be beaten to death or executed by his or her family when that word gets out. Because they have apostatized, you see. They have, they have left the faith. It's happening right now. And that mentality will come uh, among us. Jesus said it himself, but do not think that I've come to bring peace on the earth. Not peace, but a sword. And he talks about how families will be divided over him. There's nothing enjoyable about that, but it is, it is simply real. Because if we dare to walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship with others who are in the light, those who love darkness rather than light will increasingly despise the light and those who are in it. In fact, 
John says in John 3, that they will not come to the light lest their deeds be exposed. And so, increasingly, brothers and sisters, gospel light shed upon situations, even, even on family, will not be embraced with appreciation. It will be rejected with indignation. What are we to do? We've got to recognize that if people increasingly hate us, and they will, to be sure that they hate us for Jesus' sake, because they hated him first. And then be committed to endure to the end. You see, I happen to believe that what's coming to the church in the West, while painful, is going to be purifying. But there will be people who, uh, and I don't, I, I look at this congregation, I don't think we have folks like that here. But there'll be people who are kind of clinging on, hanging on, uh, hanging around, that when it costs something, I engaged a fellow years ago as I was taking a church through Reformation, and he was just, he was really upset <laughs> about something. And I asked him, I said, what does it cost you to be a Christian, to be a member of this church? And he said, before you came, nothing. Now, he was missing the point. Because Jesus says it co that discipleship is costly. It's costly. You've heard the stories that came out of World War II. Some are, some are fabricated, but some are true. I mean, I read about some, some historical evidence where, where there was a group of people gathered and some uh, soldiers broke in and got the people that were gathered for worship and lined them up and said, we want, we want the real Christians up against the wall over here. The rest of you can leave. And there were people who were gathered with them who left, who took it. And when they, when they left, then the soldiers put down their guns and said, we're Christians too, but we just we wanted to just worship with the real believers, not not those who pretended to be. There'll be a separation. But he who endures to the end will be saved. And that's what I want, to, want you to commit yourself to, to just recommit that today. What does endurance mean? It may it may mean to endure through, to to stand on the other side alive. But it may well mean to endure to the end of your life on this earth and have it taken for the gospel and you are ushered into heaven and join those, that band of martyrs under the throne who cry out, How long? How long, O Lord, faithful and true? How long must this happen? And Jesus' answer from heaven is, Until the last martyr has been martyred. It's going to be intense, brothers and sisters. Paul said this in Romans 8, 18 and 25, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's to be revealed in us. Now, you've got to get the picture he's using here. We talked about the word compare. He's talking about putting things on a scale. That the sufferings of this present time, so you, so you put sufferings on the scale, and, and, and there are places in the world right now where it's intense, where, where families are slaughtered, and, and you put that and it just pushes the scale down. He says, but the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory. So then you take the weight of glory, the glory that's going to be revealed by the Lord in the, in the consummation of the gospel, and it tips the scales, scales completely. That it's like the sufferings don't weigh a thing when glory is placed on the scales. The glory of God and the revealing of God and being in the face of Jesus. No comparison. He says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. By the way, God is the ultimate green advocate. All right. He knows better than anyone else how the, how the creation is groaning. And his sovereign plan has subjected it to such until he liberates it. Carbon footprint movements will not liberate it. 
he will liberate it. It will not be upstaged by anybody. For we know, verse 22, that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. You sense that? Wildfires, earthquakes, floods, so-called natural disasters, tragedies, all of them, but evidence of a groaning creation. as in the pains of childbirth. Not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as the final adoption. It's, it's, see, Christianity moves in, in, in movements. You, you have been saved uh, from the penalty of sin. That's justification. You are being saved from the power of sin. That's ongoing sanctification. We shall be saved from the very presence of sin. That's glorification. And so it's getting the news in the orphanage that you've been adopted, that your parents are going to come get you. And, and you see the papers... And then you see the parents. That's what we're waiting for. The final aspect of adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. Brothers and sisters, we've got to learn that when we look around at the circumstances that we don't measure reality by the circumstances. We measure reality by the promises of the Word of God, the facts of, of Scripture. For who hopes for what he sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And the word patience is similar word as enduring to the end. Paul says in Romans 12, 12, rejoice in hope. Be patient. Patient or perseverant is, is, is the word. Persevering in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. And things that happen when persecution comes. Silly things fall by the wayside. Prayer becomes paramount. I told you, ta taught you for years here and on Wednesday nights, prayer is the one, sincere prayer is the one demonstration of Christ's followers that says we recognize we are totally dependent and totally at the mercy of God. By the way, we had a wonderful prayer meeting last Wednesday night. Had a room full of people gathered for prayer. It was, it was one of the most encouraging times that I've had. Because I know this, Nothing magical about Wednesday night, but when God sets his people to praying, it means God is about to move. I encourage you to join us for that. Hebrews 10.32, but recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. And Hebrews 12.2, looking unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and that he would have us do the same. As we look unto him, we learn to have joy beyond the situation. We have joy beyond the horizon. We look beyond. That's what Jesus did. There was no joy in the cross, but, but for, for joy set before him endured the cross. We must learn to look longer, farther out to glory. First Peter 2.20. What, what credit is it, Peter asked, if... When you sin and are beaten for it, you endure. But if you go, if you do good and suffer for it, you endure. That is a gracious thing in the sight of God. So what are we to do? We're not to lose heart. We're, we're to commit to persevere to the end, no matter what the end looks like for us. And we're to commit to do good in the face of those who would do us evil. Seventh, the expansiveness of persecution and the care for the elect. People, I know folks that despise the doctrine of election. Folks, the doctrine of election is what, what keeps the heat from becoming overwhelming. Scripture teaches that. Look. But when you see the abomination of desolation, standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, neither enter his house to take anything out. Let the one who is in the field not turn back and take his cloak. Alas, for women who are pregnant, for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now. Never will be. That's how expansive it is. It's not only intense, it's extensive, if you want to say that, use that, that familiar term. Great tribulation covers comprehensively. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. 
but for the sake of the elect whom he chose. He shortened the days. Now, folks, I don't understand. I, I don't pretend to understand how God, who has marked time, the end of time from the very beginning, has the unfolding, seen the unfolding of his work, how he, how he shortens days. I don't understand it, but it's a powerful image that we get here. But look at this, this idea, this abomination of desolation. Uh, and it's in Daniel 11:31. there's this prediction of the coming of the king of the north. That he will come and desecrate the temple. In verse 31 of chapter 11 of Daniel, forces from, the, from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress, shall take away the regular burnt offering, and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. Well, this was, this was fulfilled, by the way. You need to know historically. I told you that, that prophecy has, a, has this proleptic sense about it. There's this, there's this near immediate fulfillment and then there's the long term fulfillment. And sometimes even intermittent expressions of it. Look at this. In 168 BC, Antiochus Epiphanes set up a pagan altar and sacrificed a pig in the most holy place in the temple. Certainly that was a manifestation of the abomination that causes desolation. What, what Jew would would go back in there. I told you later on, Judas Maccabeus led a revolt and cleansed the temple of this desecration. But then again, in 70 AD, this is, this is the immediate reference that Jesus had when he said, no, no two stones will be left on this, in this temple standing one or another. In 70 AD, Titus, the Roman general, sacked the temple, destroyed it. Oh, they did awful things. They sowed salt in the in the fields where you couldn't grow anything. Just made it desolate. He rode up in there, this general did on his horse, right into the Holy of Holies, mocking it all the way. They stole things from the, from the area of the altar, carried them off his booty, and destroyed the temple. And there's an anticipation of a day coming, an ultimate destruction of that which is religious will take place. And what it will do, it will have the effect of people who are trusting in religion uh, being shattered. And those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ who trust in him but who still, who still tend to be sort of earthbound, you know, we do, we do deal with that. We have an earthboundness about us. We'll not be taken away, stripped away. And all we'll have is Jesus Christ and one another. And it will be beautiful. Because you see, that's what heaven is. Heaven is filled with Jesus Christ and the glory that we have, we see in him, and we have in the fellowship of the saints. The abomination that causes desolation is coming. He says, he says of, this, of this event, the near event, that when you see it, flee. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, the most sanctified thing you can do is use your feet to remove yourself. Paul talks about fleeing youthful lusts that war against the soul. There's nothing cowardly necessarily about removing yourself from uh, persecution, as long as you don't deny in the face of it. The, re the reality is over in Iraq and Syria and places like that, that yeah, yes, there are many people being martyred for the faith, but there are also many who are, who are leaving, who are fleeing. It's, we don't look at those as cowards. The scripture admonishes us that when you see that kind of expansive persecution, that you flee, if that's possible. But when he says, don't go back to the house and get this, in other words, the, the, time, the time for being concerned about things will come to an end. And our concern will be fixed and focused upon being faithful to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the face of whatever comes to us. He talks about this tribulation that's coming that has not been, and, and, and we've cited some historical examples of, of intense persecution, expansive persecution, but there's a day coming worldwide. Now stop and just... just Picture in your mind a map of the world. Persecution of Christians is going on right now in India and in China. Again in Russia. Russia had, 
had put this facade out of being having freedom of worship. I've been to Russia and taught pastors over there, and we were, we were given strict parameters what you can and cannot do. Uh, so yeah, there was a there was a measure of religious freedom. That's gone. Putin has has just by fiat decree overruled that. And now now my brothers and sisters in Christ, whom I've fellowship with there are, are on the on the hunted list. Russia, India, China, the Middle East, portions of Africa, coming to Europe. My point is the expansiveness of it, where is it not yet? Here. Here. It's coming. And again, I don't, please, please do not hear me preaching doom and gloom. I'm not. I just, I'm saying some of what Jesus is going to say at the end of this passage when we get to the end of Mark 13. Be ready. Stay awake. Don't get caught sleeping in this. Don't let somebody tell you it can't happen here. Because I can, we can back up even as recently as when I arrived here almost 11 years ago now. And it would have been hard to fathom that an agenda could be underway in this nation that has as its goal, make no mistake about it, this is not about liberty for people, equality for people, has as its goal the taking down of what David Gashi said is the last bulwark, the last wall, the last holdout to just complete and wanton licentiousness and moral abandon. And it is conservative Christianity. A tribulation has not been. Pastor Bill, how will we how will we make it through this? Well the good news is that God has already determined that for the sake of those whom He has chosen in Christ, it won't go on indefinitely. He will cut those days short. And I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters, people who despise the doctrine of election right now, who are real followers of Jesus Christ, are going to be thrilled at it in that day. The promise here given in that day. But for the, his sake, the sake of his name on his people, it will not be ultimately unbearable, and it will not be ultimately undoing the advance of the gospel. All of this will happen. It will come to us. Some of us will live to see it, some of us will not, but I'm quite sure that our children and grandchildren will see it and experience it and live through it. And I don't want to bump into one of my kids in heaven or grandkids in heaven who say, why didn't you tell us about this? You seemed to talk like everything was going to be hunky-dory and peaches and cream and just rosy as it could be. We could tiptoe through the tulips and just... No, I'm not going to do that. Because the scripture doesn't teach it. Nor am I going to teach us to, to hunker down with, with fear and, and, a, and, a, and a pessimism. What I pray God will help us to do as we study through this passage and, and, and come to wrap it up uh, in a couple of weeks' time is let you be realistic and hopeful. Realistic and confident. Joseph Son, remember him? He spoke here. When he was being held by that police captain who had beat him knocked him out of his chair, accused him of sedition because of all these sermon tapes that were going out of his. And then what he said, he looked at the man, he said, your greatest weapon is killing me. My greatest weapon is dying. Because if you kill me, my blood will be sprinkled all over these sermon tapes. And people will ask, what was it this man believed and taught and shared that was so important that he was willing to die for it? That's the glorious good news.
two occasions that stick out in my mind was when John Piper stood at one of our founders' conferences to speak, and he opened his topic saying, I'm here to recruit martyrs. That jolted me then. I've got I to gotta confess to my shame, it jolted me. And then our friend David Sitton, when he stood before young people that had assembled at, at the camp that we sponsor at the time, hundreds of them, said, I'm here to recruit martyrs. Now, I'm here as your pastor to prepare my own heart for that and to help you prepare for that so that we can live for Christ boldly, confidently, victoriously as more than conquerors because of him who loved us. Knowing that nothing, not nakedness, not peril, not famine, not the sword, the sword being death, not even execution for the cause of Christ will separate us from the love of God shown to us through Christ Jesus our Lord. Persecution is inevitable, brothers and sisters. But it's not. It's not overcoming. By God's grace, through the blood of Christ, we are the overcomers. We're the overcomers. Nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God shown to us in Christ Jesus. And so here's the challenge that I leave you with this morning. We live right now in times of relative peace. Let us not be guilty of squandering those to tell the good news of Jesus Christ and his love. And let us prepare ourselves for the day and prepare our children and our grandchildren for the day. And they may well be called upon, and we may too, to deny Jesus Christ. And they'll be faced with the dilemma that our brothers and sisters in Christ face every day of the year around the world. Deny Christ and be spared. Confess Christ and be slaughtered. If you've read about the young girl who was in captivity uh, by ISIS, they were using her to promote their torture and told a group of folks who were about to be released with ransom money, she's smarter than you. She's converted to Islam. And she spoke up and said, no, I have not. No, I have not. She was brutalized for a, a year and a half in their captivity and never, never denied the Lord Jesus Christ unto her death, never denied him. Be faithful unto death, brothers and sisters. Be faithful unto death, however that comes for you and for me. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, I confess there's topics that are easier to teach and preach about. And yet, Lord, the day in which we live convinces me there's not a topic more critical for us to consider. I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ here, for, for those who have been faithful for so many years and those who have entered recently onto the journey of faithfulness, following Christ all the days of our lives. That's our commitment. Lord, help us to be prepared. Help us to take your word seriously and soberly and yet uh, with, with joy and celebration, knowing that because you have loved us, and chosen us and sent Jesus to die for us and rise again and because you've given us your spirit to indwell us that not even martyrdom can separate us from you help us to get ready for the persecution that is inevitable for your glory 
for the name of Christ, for the advance of the gospel, and for the good of souls who may now want to see us exterminated. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.